I'm delighted to uh, introduce Dr. Bernadette Reinholdt. Uh, Bernadette is director of the Oskar Kokoschka Center at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. Um, Dr. Reinholdt's work has focused on modern art, architecture and cultural policy in Vienna, amongst uh, many other areas. Uh, she has recently jointly edited a volume of uh, with new insights and perspectives into Kokoschka, and that's due to be published uh, in the not too distant future, possibly uh, April, May. Um, in discussing the life and work of Oscar Kokoschka, uh, Dr. Reinhold will be bringing us closer to a man whose artistic output perhaps reflects the uncertainty and agitation of the times he lived through. And, uh, and who, like the subject of uh, last night's inaugural talk in this symposium, the writer Stefan Schweig, uh, was compelled to flee his homeland and move to Great Britain when the, the Nazis came to power in the 1930s. Um, so, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Bernadette Reinhold. So, thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this symposium, and thank you for your friendly introduction. And yes, best regards from Vienna. Well, I want to talk about Kokoschka as artist and representative of the Viennese modernism. And alongside the elder, I guess, most famous Gustav Klimt, you know, Egon Schiele, who was nearly the same age as Kokoschka, but he died through the Spanish flu in 1918. Uh, both can be counted to the younger, more radical artists who overcome secessionism and, uh, or Art Nouveau, uh, Jugendstil. The third one of this generation is the less known Richard Gerstl, in my eyes, the most radical artist, but he committed suicide in 1908. So, but let's come back to Kokoschka. He was born in 1886 and died at the age of 94 in 1918. Uh, within the before named trias, Kokoschka is definitely the brutalist, the bad boy, uh, less or no aesthetic uh, aestheticist like Schiele or, or Klimt. For huge parts of the audience, his work seems <clears throat> very edgy, provocative, uh, also until now. So, in the following, I want to concentrate on the young Kokoschka, so more or less the time around 1910. <clears throat> and I have to mention that I will stress uh, a more radical uh, extreme positions in his oeuvre. So I hope you won't miss too much, or perhaps I can answer your questions uh, in the discussion later on. I will emphasize on three main aspects in Kokoschka's early work. First, I call it a painting as vivisection. So the focus will be Kokoschka's portrait art, his vivisection as a friend, the writer Albert, um, Albert Einstein named it, and of the Viennese avant-garde circles and their audience, their commissioners and mentors. As a second point, I will talk about the virulent discourses about the battle of the sexes. So we will learn more about the different medias Kokoschka used as a painter, a poet, a writer, a theater man, uh, an agitator and provocateur. So I put the title of his drama, uh, Murderer, Hope of Women, here. This topic fascinated and captivated him for more than 10 years, uh, nearly around 1918 uh, and 19. And third, under the artist's damnation, I will show how okay Kokoschka became or better dealt with his image as bad boy, as enfant terrible, as oberwilding, how he came around with, uh, <coughs> with self-fashioning as outlaw and also victim of the Viennese art scene with long-term consequences. So we'll start uh, with his early years from 1904 to 1909. Kokoschka studied at the Wiener K and K Kunstgewerbeschule, so the Imperial School of Applied Arts in Vienna. So it's the nowadays University of Applied Arts, so my university now. 
After reform, the school had become a hotspot of progressive modern art. Professors at this time were, we heard some uh, of the names at Roots Talk, uh, were the architect uh, Joseph Hoffmann, like artists Bertolt Löffler, Koloman Moser, Alfred Roller, who worked as a stage designer close together with Gustav Mahler, the composer and director of the Opera House in Vienna. So, and there was Franz Schischek, the pioneer of modern children's art education. Kokoschke should become an art teacher first, but his male talents were discovered very soon by his teachers. And um, many of them, of the teachers, became mentors and first collectors of his art. So Kokoschke began to work for the Wiener Werkstätte uh, and for this, uh, uh, for example, designing postcards. So you, uh, you see one example in the style of old <clears throat> vernacular woodcuts in the taste of folk arts. But if you look closer to the topic girl with lamp and two robbers, you realize that there are hidden stories which are told at the same time. So in 1908, he got the chance for his debut at the famous Kunstschau, the um, art show. Uh, it was an exhibition celebrating the emperor's Franz Josef Diamond's Jubilee. The curators were nobody else than Gustav Klimt and Josef Hoffmann. And they decided to give an, the art student a small exhibition space for his own. Well, following the motto, uh, also bad news are good news, this debut turned out to be a big scandal. So works have been lost, like the design for tapestry triptych, die Traumtragenden, the dream bearers. But we know a caricature. It's called, uh, as you can see, it's from Theo uh, Zasche, die Traumhaberten. Uh, so the, the, the translation, the dream walking is not quite correct. It's more if you have slept and you're awakened and, and you're a little bit disorientated, dizzling. So uh, the dream walking, walking flea scratches from the tiny Oscar Kokoschka. So also the warrior, you can see it on the left, was discussed. Kokoschka remembered dozens of years in his autobiography that little girls put chocolate papers in the mouth of the sculpture, which seems to be a, a self-portrait. And the art critics were very hard and harmful for Kokoschka. So have a look at the vignette of his book, Die Träumenden Knaben, The Dreaming Boys, which was published at the Wiener Werkstätte this year. Kokoschka dedicated it to Gustav Klimt, his early mentor. So the vineyard shows young people an imagination of the secessionist Holy Spring. Uh, but the beauty of the line of the Jugendstil, the Art Nouveau, has completely gone. Hard and clumsy moves, we see a childlike binner organization in the drawing. So there is an undeniable break in aesthetics. At this point, we have to consider that the new sense or interruption in a way conceived mostly scattering criticism, but gave him access to the avant-garde circles around Karl Kraus, Peter Altenberg, the composer Arnold Schoenberg, many of them, and especially the architect Adolf Loos, so also Ruth was mentioning him. Uh, the later became his mentor and offered him to quit off the Wiener Werkstatt, the WW, the WW, so as Lourdes called it uh, very ironically, the Wiener W, what means the Viennese way, the Viennese harm. So Lourdes said uh, Kokoschka's talents were uh, been wasted there, making painting fans and uh, designing postcards, and told him to be a freelance and promised to find, for example, portrait commissions. So, and if the persons didn't want the portraits in the end, uh, so he, Loos, bought it by himself. So in this way around, uh, Loos became one of the first big collections of Kokoschka's works because he very often had to fill in. Loos became what Karl Kraus called Kokoschka's foster father. And the whole avant-garde group around them estimated the young Kokoschka the very young, pale and very shy man for being uh, highly provocative and radical at the same time. So Running Amok, Der Amokläufer, is a small work on paper at this time. It proves Kokoschka's interest in Chinese and Persian miniatures and shows 
an agitated man running with a knife in the one hand and the burning torch in the other, watched by some kind of audience in a stage-like setting. I will refer to this later, but on his left arm, we see a tattoo with a O key. So his monogram, OK, and uh, um, same with his signature. And a short formula with L dot L, which stands for Lilith Lang, his beloved classmate at the Kunstgewerbeschule. So the first owners of this exceptional, highly condensed work was the very well-known art historian couple Hans Tietze and his wife Erika Tietze Konrad. They were obviously recruited as commissioners by Adolf Loos. Tietze was a respected cultural and museum official and a prolific writer like his uh, wife Erika. Later, through the Kokoschke exhibition at the Hagenbund uh, Gallery in Vienna in 1911, both were convinced to engage not only for old masters, but also for contemporary art. So it was some kind, Kokoschka's work was some kind of enlightenment uh, in this uh, show. Um, so, but both were, um, the, the portrait uh, was made in 1909, so very early. So they and many other Viennese and later German art historians, critics, and finally also art dealers became more and more part of Kokoschka's professional and intellectual network. So on the one hand, he had a lot of very enthusiastic uh, enemies, but also many potential supporters at the same time. It works as well known the system of the French Impressionists. So the trias of artist, art critic, and art dealer remember the friendship of Claude Monet and uh, Emile Zola. So the portrait seems to be a blurry image made out of a colored clouds. Looking closer, we can see a very unorthodox way of painting, adding colors and removing it, scratching additional drawing symbol signs with the brush handle, or sometimes even with the fingers and the fingernails. So one can imagine how odd, inappropriate the painting seemed to large parts of the very conservative Viennese art audience. So the still life uh, with Mutton and Hyacinth, 1910, was painted in the house of the famous Viennese internist, Dr. Oskar Reichel. <clears throat> he was an uncompromising collector of very young art, including Schiele and Max Oppenheimer, beside Kokoschka and other radicalists. It is told that Kokoschka was invited for the Easter meal, but asked the house owner, the landlord, instead of eating the mutton to organize this very special still life. The eldest son has to contribute his aquarium with the lurch and his turtle, a white mouse, a ripe tomato, and finally <clears throat> a hyacinth complete the installation. Again, the reaction of the art audience was quite negative. Because of the unusual arrangement, as far as the different visual ob objects stand for different intensive tastes and orders, so the mutton, the uh, strong uh, odor of the uh, hyacinth and perhaps the mouse. And because of the rather un or better anti academical color and brush application, the undefined background, so it's some kind of bad painting in a way. Like the teachers <clears throat> who exiled to New, to New York after the Anschluss in 1938, Oskar Reich and his family had Jewish roots. <clears throat> so he lost his whole property, had to sell his collection under evil uh, circumstances, and still died in died still in Vienna in 1941. Two of his sons immigrated to the USA and late in America. His wife uh, survived the concentration camp in Theresienstadt and went to the US too, but one of his sons was killed by the Nazis. So as we heard yesterday from Richard Stamp about Stefan Zweig, the progressive cultural climate of Viennese modernism mostly is a contribution of mentors and collectors who derived from Jewish families. As I told before, many commissioners of laws like Martha Hirsch, we see her on the right, and her husband, the Czech-based industrialist Wilhelm uh, Hirsch was has Jewish roots and were asked by Loos 
to be portrayed by his young friend Kokoschka. So the position of the person, the gaze, the indifferent, non-representative background, the strange skinned colored surface of the canvas opens a new sense of awareness of the inner life of the person. So looking at Father Hirsch, you can imagine what Albert Einstein, the friend and writer mentioned before, meant by use of the term vivisection, so um, in connection with his portraits. Father Hirsch was the father of Kokoschka's very close friend Ernst, an actor and director, with the artist named Ernst Reinhold, so not a relative of mine, um, and the Viennese painter Felix Albrecht Harter. Their old father was told to be very impulsive, rather aggressive and easily irritable. So I want to give you a taste of the rather expressive, expressive kind of art criticism in these days. I choose two examples around Kokoschka's first major exhibition at Hagenbund Gallery, I mentioned it in 1911. The first stems from the well-known art historian and professor at the University in Vienna, Josef Strigowski. The second is from the progressive art critic Arthur Rössler, a very close friend and mentor of Schiele. So, and Schiele has tried to make friends to Kokoschka, but he failed heavily, so uh, Kokoschka never was interested in, in the connection to Schiele. But listen to the comments and um, enjoy. So, I quote. Um, now, there is this Kokoschka. One can recall the slaughtered poster with which the Kunstschau unleashed him at the time in order to arouse the people's curiosity by giving the creeps. Even today, he has hardly reached maturity. It seems that all the evil spirits were involved in his upbringing. With these coco rays of his psyche, he shines through the persons who have the misfortune to get under his brush. Oh, sorry. What a foul smell emanates from the portrait of Dr. L. I knew a position that could be excellent is suited for him. Let him paint certain places with frightening images of syphilis and perilous. If one has survived these cocoa holes of the hagbind, only those should go there who are interned in clinics for syphilis or who can endure cabinets of anatomic wax figures. Then one should recover in the two opposite rooms with beautiful decorative landscapes. So now the quote from Arthur Rössler. In order to make sure of a triumph, the youngsters invited Oskar Kokoschka to be their guest. He came and he filled two holes with his limos drawn by the bros of Chewy, Yui, Pash, blood clots and greasy, sickened sweat. The long hidden inner life of the soul has been uncovered by Oskar Kokoschka. So the nervously tickled neurasthenics and German obscurants are calling. He brews his colors from poisonous decay and from fermenting secretion. They shimmer, gal yellow, fever green, frost blue, hectic red, and their binder seems to be penetrating yodiform, kabolic, and as a foedita. He smears them like an ointment and let them encrust with gradually scars. He paints the faces of people who dwell in a foul air of their offices, who lust for money, loitering in the expectation of happiness and who are nastily amusing themselves. He paints their might like skin, their acrid flesh steaming with inner heat, worn out by debauchery, eroded by disease. Perhaps the awkward depiction of this disgusting impurity of spongy and porous, leathery and flabby, dotted and speckled, ailing bodies is nothing more than the desolate expression of a soul in agonizing decay, staring at the world through calcified eyes. They have certain meanings as manifestation of a decaying time. If a distinctly evaluated, they are a carnage of color. So, well, 
as you know, the movement of modernity all over in Europe, in France, in Bohemia or later Czech Republic, in Germany as, uh, has a tendency to abstraction to non-objective art. Not so in Vienna, where the body becomes open to the projection of inner psychological tensions. The bourgeoisie society, as we know through the studies of Freund, uh, Freud and his colleagues, with suppressed sexuality, emotions and aggressions. In this case, the nudes offer a special side through the eyes of the artist. Here we see sketches from Lilith Lang, the mentioned uh, young colleague of Kokoschka at the Kunstgewerbeschule, who he felt in love with all his senses and desires. The twisted position, the lean body on the border between child and woman fascinated Kokoschka. Lilith becomes um, a protagonist in many different works, works of arts in his time around 1907 and 08. A young lady from a liberal family who took care about the education of their children, especially also of their daughter. And Lilith's mother was a prominent woman's right activist. So on the other side, um, we find one of the many drawings made in a few minutes while the model was allowed to move in the room by Kokoschka. So he engaged, for example, members of a circus family to stand model, unadorned, unsparing the woman, perhaps a prostitute, with blue patches of beatings or fights in an unfavorable position with slipped stockings. But in the difference to Klimt or sometimes Sheila's nudes, you don't get the sense of voyeurism. Who is watching whom? So as mentioned before, Kokoschka wrote a fairy tale and illustrated it, The Dreaming Boys, published by the Wiener Werkstätte and dedicated to his mentor, Gustav Klimt. The content is not as told a children's story, but an early expression lyric, uh, expressionist lyric about the awakening, uh, awakening of the sexuality of the, so the title, The Dreaming Boys. The author didn't take care about the coexistence of the illustrations and the other way around. In eight paradise-like landscapes, different scenes take place. The last one, as Kokoschka later said, is a love letter within an image. The girl Lee and me, it's easily to recognize that it's Lilith Lang, his beloved classmate at the Kunstgewerbe and himself. A lot of symbolistic animals and flowers surrounded the isolated young couple from each other, oddly twisted, unsettled in an insecure behavior. One, that main topic of this year is obvious. I struggle for womanhood. Ich ringe um die Frau. Kokoschka was a multi-talented artist who wrote poems, plays, prosa, who tried different styles and ways of expression in his pictures and his written works in a very unorthodox way. Ich ringe um die Frau, A Struggle for Womanhood, was the title of a martini uh, at the well-known Cabaret Fledermaus, the Bad Cabaret. So here you see the personal invitation for his friend Arnold Schoenberg. Uh, they uh, began to work together so uh, in this time from March 1909, which was personally signed by OK and uh, the mentioned actor Ernst Reinhold. So beside you see a photograph with them both, with the painter Max Oppenheimer, uh, a close friend in this time, and later the two painters became uh, very evil congruents. So a few months later, in July 1909, his first performance of the play Murder, Hope of Women took place. It was part of the additional performance, the theatre program of the International uh, Internationale Kunststoff, the International Arts Show. So where a few paintings of Kokoschka were exhibited, but also by Van Gogh and other international stars. It ended in a turmoil and a police intervention, separating the angry audience from the frenetic supporters. So the poster, as Josef Strigowski mentioned, the slaughterer poster before, shows a pieta, the final stage of the battle, the war of sexes. 
the Rio land, of course, is about the peaceful living together with each other, the fight for the same rights and the aggressive misogynic atmosphere in Vienna in this time were omnipresent. One of the mostly discussed authors was uh, Otto Weininger with his crude, extra mischievous, mischievous manifest Geschlecht und Charakter, Sex and Character from 1903. So in Kokoschka's murder, Murderer, Hope of Woman, uh, it is situated on the turn of the matriarchy to patriarchy in a quite antique setting. The idea is that the figure of the murderer deliberates from the evil of the patrial, patriotic order. So as we know, Kokoschka was quite early inspired by Bachofen's matriarchy theories. Their man and their woman meet, followed by his warriors on the one side and her maids on the other. Both were highly attracted by each other, but in a brutal act, the man burns uh, the woman with a sign of property. So she cuts him with a knife, imprisons him, and in an uh, indecided, undecided fight with, mytho myth with mythological blood influsion, um, they get into a balance of horror. So the poster shows the Christian iconography of the Pieta, mother and woman, birth and life giving and death bringing at the same time. The sun and the moon stands for the male and the female principles. So the intact but bloodless dead woman and the vivid man who is nothing more now than simple flesh, a corp. So in 1910, Kokoschka published his play in the expressionist avant-garde magazine, Der Sturm, a Berlin-based magazine made by Herbert Weiden. Loos has sent Kokoschka to Switzerland at the turn of 1909-1910. Then he came to Berlin and finally Munich. So his drawings seems to be like ink cuts the content has turned the other way around. Now the man appears to be the sole aggressor. Similar to the Amok life, the running Amok, the audience is included. That reminds to different forms of theater experiments in this time and later times in Vienna. So, and the dog is licking the blood from the floor an animus sign in the situation of explicit sexual aggression and violence. So the figure of Jack the Ripper fascinated the European art scene, for example, in place of Frank Wiedekind or Alban Berg's composition, the opera Lulu. Kokoschka's further interpretation of murderer hope of women has changed into a brutal imagination of femicide in a watercolor of 1908-09. You see it here on the left. He and his young contemporary's position is ambivalent, apathetic, um, empathetic, and not a celebration of manhood, but more an admission to the disaster between the sexes. He really articula articulates ex uh, explicitly his opinion, but also irony and humor most drives him to other narratives uh, as in his comedy, the grotesque, so we saw um, at the invitation for the I Struggle for Womanhood, we saw an invitation for this uh, comedy. The grotesque later, he called it uh, Sphinx and Strawman, the story of a cuckold husband and his nymphomatic wife uh, with the name Lily and later Anima and the bubble-like child. So I want to come with a very big leap to the end of Kokoschka's occupation with this topic. From spring 1912 to the turn of the year 1914-15, so beginning of, world of the Great War, Kokoschka was uh, in a passionate love affair with Alma Mahler, the young widow of Gustav Mahler. As we know from the Lilith Lang period, uh, also his love to Alma Mahler found entrance to his art in more than six paintings. So we here see one of the most beautiful paintings uh, of this love couple. Um, six paintings, some uh, graphic series, more than 400 love letters, seven painted fans, uncountable drawings, 
poems, plays like uh, Orpheus and Eurydice, and finally, Puppet. After his military service, where he survived uh, heavy injuries in 1915 and 1916, he came to trace in Germany and tried to recover from physical and psychological injuries. The letter to the doll maker were published early in 1925 under the title The Fetish. So to those in drawings, four paintings developed the doll into a multimedial uh, art project. The projection of his sexual pathological complexes, the loss of the lost uh, lover, is interwoven in the idea of the old mythological Pygmalion complex of Ovid, the, the tale of Ovid, to create an ideal female figure while I should give breath into it. In 1917 and the following years, Kokoschka did a lot of theatre work, had a performance of his Sphinx and Strawman, also called Automatenkomödie, so a comedy of uh, machines, automats, at the Tada Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich. So the eminent surrealistic touch inspired late, uh, later artists. But this is the fascina fascinating story of the afterlife of the notorious notorious doll. So we come back to Kokoschka, the enfant terrible, the Oberwildling, as the well-known art critics, Viennese art critics Ludwig Hevesi labeled him, the bad boy of Viennese modernity. After the scandal of the per first performance of Murderer Hope of Women in 1909, he shaved his head as an act of protest against the harsh critics and stigmatized himself in these days, only inhabitants of prisons, insane asylums, panel camps, etc., had a bold head, a bolded head. So he pointed himself out as an out art outlaw, went to one of the most respected photographer, it was uh, Wenzel Weiss in this time, well dressed as he has learned by his friend Adolf Loos. As a self-fashioning, stigmatized, misunderstood uh, genius and artist, he made a self-portrait, an announcement for the uh, Mansion's Sturm magazine. It appears with a shaved head, whitened skin to remove every kind of uh, individuality, a seam along the head as a sign of violence uh, suffered, the mouth opened but unable to speak a word, although the mouth is opened. With his left hand he points to his bedded wound in a gesture we know from the Christian iconography. But he puts himself in a long tradition, tradition of old masters, of course, the self-portrait of Albrecht Dürer from 15, around 1500. A connection to Günther Bruce on the right side, the Viennese actionists, uh, is given as Kokoschka was one of the very important role models for them in the post-fascistic and very conservative uh, cultural climate in the post-war Austria through self-painting, self-cutting, and more in different performances in the 1960s. So the motif of the outcast of art of society can be found several times. For example, on a poster for a remarkable le lecture he gave in 1912, um, this ended once again in a turmoil and a police intervention separating the audience. The same was uh, with the famous concert, the Watschenkonzert, so the slap concert in 1913, an uh, important concert for the uh, music history. So Schoenberg was the conductor and compositions of Anton uh, von Webern and Alban Berg was, were on the program when, when the fight started between the different groups of audience. Uh, the police had to come and afterwards the critics wrote, it was like Kokoschka, just the music. So back to the bold head self-portray. It is also part of uh, the painting, the artist with his model second from 1923 to. In 1924, Kokoschka had an exhibition at the Neue Galerie in Vienna. And one painting, uh, not this one, 
but a portrait of two children from 1909, so children of commissioners of laws, were damaged. Kokoschka wrote an open letter criticizing the very conservative climate and the, cons uh, and the conservative audience. He got what we call now a shitstorm. And already in 1924, he got pre-fascistic uh, critics. There were some old enemies from 1908, 1909 and 1911, like the Jewish ultra-conservative uh, Adalbert Seligman, but also the art critic and illustrator Rudolf Herrmann. So there are a couple of caricatures of Herrmann. You see Kokoschka here at the easel in front of the painting that was thought to be the victim of the iconoclastic attack. So it is said, I quote, paintings by Kokoschka were damaged by an unknown person with knife, wands and rubbish. So Kokoschka, how I am supposed to repair my painting now if I don't know which dirt is mine and which is the other person's? So about 10 years later, it was Rudolf Herrmann who designed the poster for the famous Nazi exhibition that generated art starting in Munich in 1937. So more than 600 artworks of Kokoschka has been removed from German museums and um, official uh, collections. So in 1937, but this process started in the late 1920s, but the iconoclastic attack in 1924 in Vienna and especially the reactions were quite easier uh, earlier. So Kokoschka lived in Germany in this time, was professor at the Dresden Academy of Fine Arts for several, several years and had a really impressive career in uh, German from there, um, and, uh, from there outgoing in the whole Europe. So his art, his art was very prominent at the exhibition of the generated art. And after the first venues, most of his well-known paintings were auctioned by the Nazis in Switzerland to earn money by the band art. So in the booklet uh, of the exhibition, Kokoschka is mentioned several times. So here's one example. And I quote, which of these um, three drawings um, stems from an intimate inmate of an insane asylum? Astonish. Uh, the one in the upper right. The other two were once described as masterful graphics by Kokoschka. In 1933, the political climate changed not only in Germany with the rise of Hitler. In Austria, the Austro-Fascist regime dismissed the parliament and para paramilitary fights ended in the civil war in February 19. Uh, 34. So Ruth mentioned it before, and we saw the Karl Marx, of, uh, which was um, uh, one of the centers of these fights of the civil war. So through Tietze, <clears throat> Loos, and others, Kokoschka, uh, Kokoschka's political social, social, um, socialization was more left-winged. Um, but he stayed more unpolitical until the early 30s. And then he started to become a political, cultural political player in Vienna. He moved to Prague in 1934, so the, this year, but not only or directly uh, by political concerns, but for economical reasons. So in Prague, he, be he became close to the internal, international left movement and was listed by the Nazis. So in October 1938, he fled to London with one of the last possibilities where he was an important and he became an important integrative personality for German and Austrian exile communities. So he was listed uh, around number 140 of the Nazis in the case they would, in, would have invaded uh, England. So the image as a radical and political artist, as bad boy, stayed with him his whole life and he cultivated it. So in post-war times, he was an ardent advocate against abstract non-objective art. 
And in the first issue of the magazine Eltern, Parents, uh, we are peace were asked what they wanted to become when they were children. And children and Kokoschka chose the role of the Brandstifter, the arsonist. So, well, thank you for your attention. And um, I'm looking forward to your, um, your questions in the following. Thank you very much, uh, Bernadette. That was terrific. And if, if everyone wants to, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to. And I think uh, Bernadette deserves a round of applause, first of all. So thank you very much. Um, that's fascinating. Uh, fascinating talk about a fascinating artist. Um, first question we have is from Betty uh, Suga, who says, what do you think made Kokoschka such an apparently angry artist? Oh well, so I, I mentioned it. Uh, uh, his person in his he in, in as a real person, he seemed uh, very shy to other people, and the the same way around. I think he grew up in a very um, productive climate at the Kunstgewerbeschule, where many things were possible to learn and to to experiment. So in different medias and. Um, I think it was the turn in in to to put it in the art historical uh, uh, history. So uh, it came to an end with the youth, with the Art Nouveau, the secessionist movement, and the younger generation. So he's not the same age like Karl Kraus uh, or Adolf Loos. Um, I think they they came around and became very angry with with the situation uh, of this. Um, I would say very suppressed uh, kind of uh, discussions, and you also can find it in literature and and in other fields. And I think Kokoschka is one, uh, so in the sense of the word uh, avant-garde, so the, the first uh, peak uh, of a troop, of a military troop. Uh, I think um, Kokoschka and also Schönberg and um, <coughs> And others, they were the peaks, uh, so the, the point uh, of this movement, in a way, in a very radical sense. And they had to stand this uh, critics. So this was, I wanted to point out. I hope that answered your question, in a way. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Bernadette. So we've got another question from John Laycock, who says, uh, what contact did Kokoschka have with the artistic community in Cornwall, for example? For example, the St. Ives School, School or with Falmouth College of Art. So uh, we have to consider that Kokoschka came to England, to London in uh, uh, fall of 38. And he lived, um, he lived in England or in London until 1953. So uh, he became a British citizen. So he was first, of course, he was Austrian. And this was a question yesterday uh, after the talk of uh, Richard. Um, so with the citizenship of, uh, um, of Zweig. Um, so of course he would have become uh, a German citizen, but he, he lived in Prague and uh, Thomas Masaryk, the president of the Czech Republic, um, he was very close and he made a portrait, some kind of political portrait of him. He offered him to become a Czech uh, citizen. So when Kakoschke came to England, he uh, to, to London, he has been a Czech uh, citizen, and so he was not uh, interned in the camp as many of the Austrians mm -hmm. with the I, beginning of the And uh, so, um, this for the one one case, and uh, then he became British citizens. Uh, he 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 get uh, British citizenship, and of course he was very um, he was a very um, integrative person. Uh, so not only for the exile groups. Um, so we have to think about. I, I I cannot answer the question in details, but we have to consider that the art of Kokoschka was not that popular so this kind of expressionism also german expressionism art was not very uh, how to say it very close to the to the british uh, uh good to the british taste so uh 
until now, I think um, it's not the British art deal dealers who make money with Kokoschka. So it's um, it's German or, or German based um, dealers who um, have the galleries in London and so on. So, but um, and London is a very important art mark marketplace, as you know. So Thank you, I think he was connected with many many artists, but uh, yeah. Thank you, Julian. I hope that's answered answered your question. Um, another question from Renato Bronfman. Uh, how important was Alma Mahler? Uh, how important was Alma Mahler's influence over Kokoschka's art? And I, I'm right in thinking it was Alma Mahler the love of his life, but she rejected him ultimately. Yeah, in a way. So uh, we could have a whole symposium about Alma Mahler and Kokoschka in a way, and I could talk for hours about that. So uh, at the moment, I'm writing for the book you mentioned so, uh, so friendly in a friendly way. Uh, I'm writing about this doll, and I have really the problem how to put it in one essay. So um, I hope I can make a book about it when, one time only about the doll. So um, I think... Um, Alma Mahler is always pointed out as a muse, you know, this is some kind of female figuration, but she was much more, she was an um, highly educated and she was an economist. So Gustav Mahler had really uh, serious financial problems and she organized his whole life uh, on the one side. On the other side, she was a fin obviously a very uh, sensuous and uh, erotic, uh, with an erotic um, uh, appearance so um, they had a very passionate love affair there were two abortions and um, Kokoschka was impressed from the first meeting from the first uh, encounter with her and I think on the one hand so Alamala, Amamala wrote it by herself they needed each other but they hated it, uh, each other in the same way so it was um for both, in a way, it was some kind of disaster and very, very great love affair uh, at the same time. And so I told it uh, in my, uh, I, I said it in my talk, um, it has a very, very high outcome and output in his art, this uh, it's love affair, this this uh, very impressing love affair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bernadette. There's a question from uh, Andrea Kastner. Uh, did Kokoschka ever refer to the abomination of the First World War? Quite a few artists created work that referred to the horrors of especially the First World War. Or did he write about it even? Yes, I, I, I left it beside. Uh, so he was... Um, um, he was a freelance, uh, how do we say, a freelancer, a freiwilliger, uh, in, uh, soldier in First World, uh, World War One. So this was a, a tip uh, or an advice for, of, of laws. So he could choose uh, the department, which the military department, and he was seriously wounded in, in, in the Ukraine. So he got a shot through his neck and a cut in his lungs with a bayonet. And the year, the year later, this was in 1915, in 16, he was at the Isonso front and he, uh, he had really a, a great problem because he was close to an explosion and got a shock. So, um, there, are many um, uh, stories and also in his autobiography and he did, uh, so he turned, he, he was, uh, of course, um, as many Austrians thought this war was just an episode and uh, went by. So uh, nobody, especially uh, Zweig, so he, he suffered a lot of the of the end of the of the monarchy of this imperial state of with these different kinds of cultures, and so nobody thought about it. So Kokoschka, he was not that close friend of the idea of war because he's he described it in his letters. He saw people at the um, at the railway stations, uh, poor people, and and also of course the um, how it uh, it came along. So he painted himself. Um, I should have put it in my talk. He painted himself uh, as a lost soldier flying like an um, elevation, you know. But disorientated, and he had really serious uh, uh, problems um, with his lungs and with his nerves. So. Um, 
this and, and I think the, the the doll the puppet is also uh, as you put it I'm not a psychologist as a object of translation as uh, it's Winnie Scott, I think the British uh, psychologist, that you have an updraft uh, of translation to recover from a trauma, you know, uh, you have lost your, your wife, you have lost everything, you have lost your art, you cannot work anymore. So I think this is a really, it's a huge topic. So also a whole symposium in a way. Uh, thank you. Uh, so next question is from Richard Stamp. Thank you, Bernadette. A fascinating talk and subject. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, I love the arsonist self-portrait from 1967-68, and I wonder how he responded to that post-war generation and the events of 1968 across Europe. So that's it's quite an interesting question. So I told that he was left-winged, and in his time in the UK, he was very close also to Stalinistic uh, uh, groups. So of course, he saw it like many exiles that uh, Austria he has it has erased from the maps uh, can only be deliberated by the Soviets. So. Um, but he changed his mind very quick after after the war. So within some months, so his sister lived in Prague, and um, so he get informed about that many millions of peoples were uh, dismissed uh, coming from concentration camps, but also people who were German speaking. Uh, and it was some kind of, uh, I think it's, it's only in the very, very right and, uh, national socialist winged parties, but now also in the Czech Republic, younger generations become to think it over that so many people were, were killed in this early few weeks after the war. And, um, so he, he feared in a way that what happened to Prague and um, will happen to Austria. And there was some situation in 47 when he first entered the continent, he was in Switzerland and he visited his brother in Vienna and he was put out of the train of Soviet soldiers. And uh, so he was uh, about 60 uh, or 70 years old and had to stay over, over hours in, in, in the rain and so he changed his mind and became in a way very conservative in his political minds and he uh, went back in his ideas to old Greek uh, history and um, so he was an European from con con uh, convention con uh, so he was a convinced European but um, so the movement of the uh, of the students revolution of the 60s uh, this um, magazine I showed is belongs to the Imperium of the publishing house of Axel Springer, who is a very ultra conservative and he was the enemy of the students revolution in this time. So um, I guess he talking with young people and he loved to talk to young people, uh, you know, in a way he was very unorthodox in his political um, uh, opinions. But on the other hand, he became part of the establishment. And uh, yes, he was invited to paint the Berlin uh, situation in 66. And uh, so it was after the, 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 the wall has been built. So this is also a long discussion in a way. Okay, I think we've just got time for a couple more, Bernadette. Um... So Henry Kennedy asks, uh, how much did Schoenberg influence Kokoschka's work and vice versa? And I, I might add my own question to this actually, which well, is, I, I, um, I know he, I believe um, Kokoschka resisted the idea that he was influenced by anyone and that he, although he accepted the expressionist label. Um, so perhaps the general, addressing Schoenberg, but maybe also the general issue of influence that he yeah. had. I, I think I can answer this uh, a little bit shorter than the other questions. So um, the, the work together around 1909. So uh, they were very attracted by each other, by the work of each other. And Schoenberg, he wrote, so I mentioned Richard Gerstl, the painter in the beginning of my talk. And he had a love affair with the wife of Schoenberg and committed suicide in the end. So... Um, in in the afterwards, uh, Schoenberg he wrote uh, operas so um, the Glückliche Hand and and others, 
And I think that the topic of the battle of the sexes uh, uh, also is included in this in this uh, in this issue. And he invited Kokoschka to work with him together as a stage designer. So there was so they didn't uh, finally, but. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, Joe, uh, that's right. So, but Kokoschka, and this was important for me to, to I have shown in the talk, I, ho I hope uh, that of course he was part of a network. And uh, so he himself saw him um, as a lonesome uh, mountain stone. So he, uh, he get rid of uh, other colleagues like Schiele, uh, Oppenheimer, and later Picasso. So, uh, um, so in a way, it was some kind of myth and self-fashioning as uh, a solid uh, artist in a way. So, but this is also, I think, this is a very typical narration we know from from the type of genius we know from Nietzsche, and uh, so. Thank you, Bernard. There's and a question from uh, Russell. Uh, Jube, Jube, apologies if I've mispronounced that, Russell. Um, how would you describe his personality other than angry at critics? Was he a good friend? Did he have a close family ties and support? So, yeah, so we know he, he was cross with the critics, but how was he with other people? So uh, I think he was, he never had children by his own, but his uh, original family, he was very, very close to his parents, very close to his brother, to his sister, and he supported them his whole life. So, and I think if you have become friend with him, you have stayed friend with him. He was a very loyal friend. I hope I understand the question quite right. So, um and as I mentioned, the the audience, so in his autobiography, he, he tells another story, but um, from the very beginning on, he has very uh, enthusiastic supporters, yeah, critics, uh, art historians, and so on, and, and enemies. So, um, but in a way, I think he has some kind of psychological problem, uh, on the other hand, to to get it through. So, so I hope this is quite an answer to this question. Thank you, Brenda. And we'll take this, make this the last question for, again from Julian. Um, would you say that Schoenberg's paintings were influenced by Kokoschka, especially self-portraits? This is also a very good question. So, um, uh, Schoenberg began began to paint because of Richard Gerstler. I mentioned him. So Gerstler, he was not integrated in the group of other painters. Also, he studied at uh, the Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, so he was in a conflict of his professors. There is a very conservative uh, climate there. And he was integrated in the Schoenberg circle. So uh, he started painting because of Richard Gerstler. And, uh, but... He was, of course, very attracted by the radical way of painting of Kokoschka. And there is one, um, there's one portrait from Schoenberg made uh, uh, from Kokoschka. So it's, it's very interesting because it's um, typical for Schoenberg. So it's a very undefinite background and you have eyes. So it's the gaze, the, the looking. And I mentioned that Kokoschka had a, a lecture um, called uh, called um, from Bewusstsein der Gesichte, so from the consciousness of. Uh, it's not easy to translate from from the face or the gazing. Yeah, so um, how to look and to have a new look. This this was what interested Schoenberg and Kokoschka. So it wasn't directly an influence, but I think uh, inspiring uh, atmosphere in a way. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Bernadette. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I can tell everyone else here did. Um, so perhaps we could all show our appreciation to Bernadette. Thank you very much. And, and it will, hopefully we'll see as many of you as possible back at five o'clock for, a, I think, what's going to be a terrific talk by Faith Pinkers about uh, modernist women writers talking about Vienna. And a, and a reminder that at seven o'clock we have uh, a talk about music in Secessionist Vienna from Charles Whiffin. Um, Bernadette, I'm going to send you a quick email afterwards, just a, a question, a technical question I need to ask you. But other than that, thank you very much, everyone, <laughs> and see you all very soon, hopefully. Very good. Bye.
And you see this sun is coming out in Vienna. So beautiful. Beautiful. Bye. Bye.